Hey you guys, it's Katie from the blog and podcast nowthatwe'reafamily.com and today I get to talk to you guys about sleep training. I just finished sleep training my fifth child. He's now sleeping eight hours a night at a time and he's been doing that for the last week and that hasn't always been the case with all my kiddos. My goal is six hours by six weeks and some of them were so lightweight, like my first was born at only five pounds and a few ounces and so we didn't get him sleeping six hour stretches at a time until he was eight weeks old. But regardless, I follow the same methods. guys, I talk way too long in this video, so I'm going to keep this super, super quick, but the Get It All Done Club is going up in expense this fall. And so if you've been looking to join, I help women go from drowning in motherhood to thriving in motherhood and having the time to do the things that they love. Over 2000 women have been through the program. If you want more details, you can check that out down below. Also, if you join the growth initiative, if your husband joins the growth initiative and you join the get it all done club at the same time, there's a major discount. So that'll be down below too. Okay. Let's get into training our babies. I get asked a lot ever since I had a video on this channel, get a lot of views years ago after I sleep trained my second child. Um, I get asked a lot, about sleep training advice. And I just wanna say, I'm no sleep training expert at all. I've actually never read a book on sleep training. Um, what happened was my mom had 11 kids. She sleep trained all of us from birth. And then I was like, hey, what'd you do? I'm not sleeping, just tell me what to do. And I just basically did everything that she told me to do. And that's what I've done for the last few kiddos. And it's gotten better and better and better and smoother and easier. I have learned a few things over the last three kiddos. And so I'm excited to share those things with you today because my son was sleep trained with zero crying, zero crying it out, like literally not even 60 seconds. And I know that can be really stressful for a lot of moms in fact, a question that I get most often is, do I think that sleep training is biblical? Because it sounds, you know, mean to put a baby in a room and let them cry and cry and cry and cry, especially when they're a newborn. They just came out of your body. They're used to being around you 24 seven and all of a sudden it's like, isolation treatment, right? I think that's what people picture when they picture sleep training. And I think that's not the case at all um, with the way that I sleep train. But I think that why people have this misconception about sleep training is because all of us sleep train our kids at some point, right? At some point, we want them to go sleep in a room on their own and be able to sleep through the night. So we all have different goals for what that is or different ideals for what age that is. But whether that child is a week old or nine months old or two years old or four years old, at some point, we don't want them in our bed anymore or in our room anymore. And at some point they have to transition out to sleeping on their own. And at least what I've heard from a lot of mothers when they do this transition is, well, it's a couple rough nights, but then they get used to it. So I think that when you're sleep training an older child or transitioning an older child and they're not used to sleeping on their own, it can be traumatic for mommy to hear them crying in the room for 45 minutes at a time or whatever. I've heard so many different stories. Um, and I think people apply that knowledge that they have that they've personally experienced 
to when I'm talking about sleep training infants and they're like, how could you do that to an infant? Um, but it's not like that at all. So hopefully what I share with you guys is helpful in sleep training from birth. I, I put it in air quotes because it's really not sleep training. It's just helping your child get on a different schedule than what they were on when they were in your womb. So a lot of us, when our babies were in our womb, felt all the kicks and stuff at night, right? They started to like come alive at 11 o'clock at night. And then they'd be fairly inactive during the day. When our babies are first born, they still have that same schedule where they want to be awake all night. And so naturally they're gonna do most of their feedings at that time. And then they want to sleep all day. And this is really natural. And so on day three of when my children are born, I just start gently helping them transition to where they're starting to expect food during the day and sleeping at night. And it is a transition. It does take a few weeks. It sometimes takes a couple months, but it's a very gentle cycle and it has a lot to do with scheduling their eating, not their sleeping. <laughs> so let's start at the beginning here. I took notes this time because I find that it's really easy to forget, especially in the blur of postpartum to remember, okay, what did I do for days one through three? What do I do for weeks? You know, after that, all the different timelines, what were the different developmental stages of, of my baby and all those things. So for days one through three, before my milk comes in, I am just feeding at least every three hours, but whenever the baby is hungry, like whenever they're, you know, sucking their hands or crying or any of that, if it's two hours, if it's an hour and a half, I'm feeding the baby. Um, I need all that suction to help my milk come in. And if they're sleeping, longer than three hours, I'm not letting them do that. I am waking them up and with my really lightweight babies that were five and six pounds, that was really, really hard because they just wanted to sleep all the time. They're very lethargic and it was, yeah, they fall asleep while they were nursing. You had to wake them up again and get them to nurse the other side. It was just like super annoying. <laughs> but uh, so that is days one through three, okay? I'm trying to think of anything else that is helpful here. Okay, yeah. So during this time, babies are going to be very awake in the evening and they want to be close to you as much as possible. So something that I've done with my last two children that has been very helpful is side nursing in bed. I didn't, I wasn't capable of doing this with my first few kiddos because nursing was so difficult for me. Um, and you don't have to, you could just like nurse in bed and then lay down and put them up close to you next to your side. But I found that when I did this, so when I side nurse and then I burp and then I nurse the other side and then I side nurse, yeah, nurse the other side and then burp and then kind of top them off, let them suckle for a little bit more. Then I will unlatch the baby, you know, pull my shirt down so they know nothing else is happening here uh, tonight food wise or in this moment food wise. And then just let them lay there and breathe mommy and know that mommy's right there. Even when my babies were wide awake they were very content in that position and they would just snuggle. I had my arm around them and they would just drift off to sleep. Now, obviously that wasn't very comfortable for me as a parent. I mean, I loved the snuggling and the cuddling, but you have to be like very aware and awake because you aren't, don't want to roll over on your baby and you want them to keep breathing and all those things. Uh, so I'd kind of just doze in and out and it wasn't like solid sleep for me, but it's very cozy and warm and no crying because baby is awake and they are just drifting off to sleep next to mommy. Once they had drifted off to sleep, then I would flip them over. Okay, this is the controversial part. I should have said this at the beginning. I do not parent from a book. I do not parent <laughs> based off of um, really any type of I don't know, I just do what works for me, okay? I do what works for me. A lot of it's old school, a lot of it's controversial. So this is the part where if controversial child parenting methods stress you out or give you anxiety, just turn the video off, okay? Go somewhere else. Because I don't wanna stress you out, and, and I, I truly mean that. Um, but all my babies have been tummy sleepers. I feel that that is, I have found that that is the best way for my babies to go to sleep. And there's a lot of reasons for that. I get why tummy sleeping is not recommended by doctors. It's a lot easier for them to keep everything black and white and say, hey, don't sleep a baby on its stomach. 
But I think if you're a very aware mother and your conscious parent of, you know, making sure there's not anything that they're going to burrow their head into and suffocate by the sheets always stretched very, very tight. There's no, um, you know, the sheet isn't too big or too loose or something that they can bunch up under their nose. Um, I found that my babies are just fine sleeping on their tummy and they are so much happier on their tummies. There's a few reasons for this. One, there's pressure on their stomach. And so if they need to spit up or they need to burp, it's a lot easier when they're on their backs. It's very uncomfortable for them and they need you to pick them up and give them that pressure either with your hand or with your shoulder so that they're able to get that burp out. And often they can just do it on their own. If they have gas in their stomach, it works out a lot easier. They can kind of grunt, squiggle around. That pressure is very comforting for a baby. I know that we've tried to recreate that, um, especially so that our babies don't startle right when they're on their backs and they wake themselves up because they have that startle reflex that doesn't happen on their tummies because their hands are flat to the bed. Um, and we've tried to, you know, help that problem while sleeping babies on their backs while swaddling them. But the problem is with the swaddle is I have swaddled my babies before and I've been uncomfortable when they start to get out of the swaddle. I feel like it only takes one time for them to suffocate while getting out of a swaddle. And so that's made me personally nervous. I know as mothers, we all have different things that make us nervous um, and keep us up at night. But that's something that for me made me uncomfortable. And the other thing is, is at some point, baby's not going to sleep in a swaddle anymore. So you have to go through another transition of getting them to sleep without the swaddle, without that comfort that they've been used to over and over and over. Whereas when they tummy sleep, you don't have to go through that transition of basically training them to get used to not sleeping with the swaddle. Obviously when my babies tummy sleep, I don't use a pacifier. Um, it's really easy for them to find their finger or their thumb or their fist and just kind of suck on that if they want to suck on something during the night to kind of comfort them. Um, but I'm not saying that's right for everybody. That is just what I do. And I know that, um, that, that really bothers some people, but it's, it's what I've done and what I'm going to continue to do. So that said, once my baby falls asleep on their side, I could just keep them on their side, but I want them to get used to tummy sleeping. And so I just slide them over next to me and lay them on their tummy, making sure that, you know, my blankets aren't going to suffocate them or the pillow or all that, you know, make sure it's a clean area. We sleep in a king bed. So there's a lot of room on one side. If you have one of those little like snooze or, you know, those little like baby beds you could put in your bed, that'd be an awesome thing to put them into. Um, but regardless, I put them away from me at that point. So yes, I'm comforting them to sleep after I feed them, but then they get used to kind of a little bit of separation between mommy and me, right? And so they're able to start to get used to sleeping on their own. So this is a gradual transition. Something that you want to do to keep baby asleep as much as possible is change their diaper in the middle of the feeding. Um, so nurse one side, then change their diaper, then nurse the other side. Or if they have a dirty diaper right when you think you're wrapping up nursing, I change that diaper and then top them off. <laughs> the little top off is not really for food. It's just for comfort and kind of lulling them back to sleep. And so that's kind of the, the routine that I follow with my babies, but I don't want to, you know, change their outfit if they've spit up all over it or I don't want to change their diaper uh, at the end of a feeding because they're going to be more awake at that point. You want to end with some form of them sucking or, you know, rocking against you or something like that. I found that they go back to bed a lot easier. So this is where kind of the magic starts to happen is once my milk comes in. So once my milk comes in from about three days to three weeks, now I am starting to schedule my babies. And I try to do this as soon as possible because this is the easiest way to do it. And I do this during the day. So during the day I wake up at whatever time baby wants to wake up, we nurse. And then I only nurse them now every three hours. Now this isn't that extreme. A lot of women nurse every three hours just in general, you know, even if you're nursing on demand or something like that, but it is different when you're following a strict schedule for those first few days, because it's really starting to help baby know what to expect and when to feed. And it's going to make a huge difference in their sleep. So even if you go back to nursing on demand, once your baby's sleeping through the night, um, 
this is the time where if you want baby to sleep through the night on their own, then you're gonna need to be scheduling most likely. So I wake baby up, I nurse, and I go from start to start of the feedings. That's what my three hour window is. So for instance, if I nurse at nine, I'm nursing again at 12. And when you have a newborn, there's a chance that they're nursing for 45 minutes. So I don't say I finish nursing at 945. I don't start the three hours from that point. I start it from when I began the feed. So nine, 12, three, two. <laughs> one, two, three, yeah, three, um, and just kind of keep that schedule going and that rhythm going, regardless of how long it takes baby to feed, whether that's 15 minutes or an hour and a half, I'm keeping on that rhythm. And you have to be strict starting out. Once baby's sleeping through the night, I will give or take 15 minutes. Um, if I need to leave to go somewhere, I will, you know, in 30 minutes, I'll be like, ah, bummer. <laughs> I'm just gonna nurse them because I need to, um, but, I, I am very, very strict, um, especially those first three to five weeks uh, after baby is born. So this is when a baby might get fussy because they want to eat. So my babies usually get fussy about 30 minutes before they feed. And that's really normal. What I've found during this time is they usually spit up quite a few times or they burp quite a few times. And so this is kind of a nice, break for their digestive system to get all that extra air out and work that gas out. They aren't starving because often it's only been about two hours since we finished nursing at max two and a half hours. So they're getting enough calories. In fact, my last son at a six week checkup had gained 50% of his weight back. The first six days after he was born, he was already back to his birth weight. And so my babies are getting plenty of food and they chunk up very quickly, even though they start out very meager for the most part. My last baby was um, eight pounds and nine ounces, which is a big baby. It, it shocked all of us. Um, and so I think that's why he's been sleeping through the night a lot earlier. And we'll touch on weight in a second there. But the point is, I'm not really concerned about baby's weight because midwife is happy. I'm happy. The weight gain goes in good pro progression. There's a good pro pro progression. <laughs> why is this so hard? Uh, weight gain happening. And so baby is not starving. Uh, I say all that to say, if they start to fuss, you know, 30 minutes prior to their nursing, they are just getting used to this new schedule and chances are they wanna eat. You know, when we smell food in the kitchen, we wanna eat too, even if it's not totally ready. So I usually hold off the babies. This would be a time to use a pacifier. Um, I will just get my pinky, I have this bent pinky that I inherited from my mother and grandmother. I have a short ligament in my pinky and it's the perfect little, uh, consolation pinky and I pop that in their mouth, carry them around so they can suck on that while I'm holding them off for feeding, but keeping that three hour mark. And if again, they are sleeping, because often during this three week stage, they could sleep for six hours during the day, I am waking them up and making sure they also don't go past three hours. So you get the point, three hours on the dot. Some things to keep in mind when I am nursing during the middle of the night is I don't schedule during the middle of the night. At this point, if, they, if they're past their birth weight, then I am just, um, I'm letting them sleep as long as they want. And I'm nursing essentially on demand during the night. Whenever baby wakes up during the night, I feed. And I do a long feeding. I try to do um, right side, burp, left side burp, make sure you're always burping in between sides. That might sound obvious to mothers who have had multiple children, but I remember as a first time mommy, I didn't realize that a lot of fussiness for babies is essentially them just having air in their stomach. And then we put more milk on top of that. It squishes the air down. It's really uncomfortable for them. And sometimes this happens a lot when you're nursing on demand because those air bubbles kind of build up in between the milk supply because baby's just snacking all the time. And and maybe they aren't, maybe they're gulping little bits of air at a time, so it's not enough to get a big burp out, uh, but they're just dealing with that discomfort. So when you're nursing for a longer period of time, I usually get a good burp um, right after on the right side and on the left side. So making sure that's always happening. Uh, keeping the lights down low during the middle of the night. If you have a little reading light, just being able to turn that on. I like that better than using a phone light because I just feel that those are so glaring in the middle of the night. I did that for the first two. Uh, but just, yeah, all those things. And then 
The other thing is at this point, you're really going to want to start keeping baby awake at least an hour and a half before bedtime, but ideally three hours uh, from that last feeding to when you feed them again, you're going to want to keep them awake. This is way easier said than done. Um, when I'm trying to keep them awake, if I lay them there and their eyes just start to close, you know, they're so heavy. I set them down on the carpet, on the floor, and they'll just startle themselves to wake awake usually. And then I'll pick them up, but it can kind of be this time consuming process of them. As soon as you pick them up and they're cozy against mommy, they're like, oh, I want to go to sleep. And you need to like keep them awake, do whatever you can um, to keep them awake for again, at least an hour and a half to three hours before that final nursing, before you go to bed. The, the longer they're awake, the harder they're going to sleep. I know that's obvious, but it's it still needs to be said sometimes when we're sleep deprived and we can't remember these things. Usually during this three week period, I'm letting baby start to sleep longer if they can. So if they've gained more weight and they can sleep a little bit longer and they're going four hours or five hours in between a feeding, then I usually will let them go that long, but sometimes I need to wake them up because my milk supply is just too heavy and so I need them to feed. So sometimes I will still be waking my baby up during this time as I'm needing to regulate my uh, milk supply, but that's more for my sake than for theirs. And if you need to do that, don't worry, you aren't messing anything up. Um, baby's not getting used to you waking them up or anything like that. So around three weeks ish, that is when I started transferring, um, Lionel. So my fifth born to the bassinet by the side of my bed up until this point, he'd been doing the same thing where he'd fall asleep against me. And then I would lay him down, um, next to me on his belly. And then I just started seeing how it went when I would nurse him and I'd go straight to his belly and that's kind of what we did for three weeks and then around three weeks i was like okay i'm gonna put him in his bassinet now next to the side of our bed uh, at this point i also most of the time babies aren't having dirty diapers in the middle of the night around this time you aren't dealing with the merconium and again they're starting to be awake more in the day and go to the bathroom more during the day and sleep during the night due to you waking them every three hours or keeping them on that three hour schedule during the day and so what i do is i don't change baby's diaper at night unless it is a dirty diaper um, with boys you might need to uh, meaning you know the number two in the diaper um, with boys, sometimes I have to change their diaper because it's going to overflow just the way that they're genetically made up. They usually soak through the front of their diapers more than I never had issues with my daughter doing that, but I've have had that happen with all of my sons. So sometimes what's helpful if that's happening when they're sleeping longer stretches and then they're waking up with a soggy diaper that is leaking out the top is to size up during the night. Um, so it can just hold more in the front there. Usually the back is pretty dry. <laughs> um, but again, I try to keep them as drowsy as possible. So as little transition as possible, um, during those nighttime feedings. Something to remember is baby sleep is not linear. So I remember tracking the hours that my baby was sleeping with my fourth born. And I was so discouraged because at three and four weeks, he was doing about four and a half to five hour stretches during the night. And then at six weeks that went down to, he was back waking about every three hours during the night. And I was so bummed out about that with maybe like a four hour stretch here and there during the week. But then at seven weeks, he started sleeping five hour stretches and then at eight weeks, he was giving me those coveted six hour stretches at a time uh, during the middle of the night. So something to keep in mind is you want to be asleep when your baby is sleeping that longest stretch, obviously. <laughs> uh, so enter the dream feed, okay? Essentially, baby's going to start to want to go to bed now around 8.30 or so, starting at maybe five or six weeks. And maybe you don't want to go to bed at that period of time. With this baby, my fifth, I knew I had to go to bed the second baby went to bed. Uh, I just drop everything and be like, you know what? He's asleep. I'm going to sleep too, because I needed to get that longer stretch in. And that was happening when they went to bed 
the first time. That was when they were he was giving me the longest stretch of sleep. So if I put him to bed at 9.30 at night, I was going to bed because he was gonna give me about four hours during that amount of time. Now, as baby starts to transitioning to going to sleep earlier, say 8.30, maybe even 7.30, you probably aren't gonna be ready to go to bed at that point. And at around five or six weeks, you're probably getting back to more of a normal day schedule. You aren't sleeping all the time or getting naps during the day or whatever the case may be. And you want to go to bed at nine o'clock or 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock um, when your spouse is going to bed. So I actually just ended up doing this uh, last night because Elisha and I were having a conversation Lionel went to bed at 8.30 and I wasn't ready to go to bed at 8.30. And that, but it, I mean, you gotta think of it, like I put him to bed at 8.30 and then we're awake 9.30 and 10.30, right? So we're awake for two hours. That means I, if I go to sleep at 10.30, I'm gonna only get two or three hours of sleep even if he sleeps five hours. Or I'm only gonna get five hours of sleep if he sleeps seven hours. So all of those uh, case scenarios are frustrating for me because I feel like I just missed out on two hours of sleep if baby was sleeping for two hours. So that's when you do the dream feed. The dream feed can be one hour after your last feed. It could be three hours after your last feed. It could be five hours after your last feed. Uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, you don't have to keep on a three hour schedule for this feeding. Essentially, you get baby out of bed where they're sleeping and you nurse them at whatever time you want. And that restarts your clock. So now they're going to give you a long stretch because of that dream feed. and kind of tides them over and helps them sleep for more hours while you are sleeping. So they might not nurse as much as they usually would because they're a little drowsy and they're a little sleepy. Uh, but that will buy you more time and you don't need to worry about that being on a three hour schedule. You don't have to worry about just sitting around until your baby wakes up. You can just do it at whatever time is convenient for you. Put baby down and then feed baby right before whatever time it is that you're going to bed. And that's gonna give you that nice long stretch. The other thing to keep in mind when it comes to scheduling baby, so I do that dream feed and then I'm still nursing on demand or whenever baby wakes up in the middle of the night. And at this point, like I said, he is sleeping eight hours, seven to eight hours for the longest stretch. Or if I'm doing a dream feed at 10.30, then he's giving me maybe seven hours from that point. Uh, but the point is, is that he's giving me this nice long stretch of sleep and then kind of awkward times on either side. So I tracked actually, um, let me get a cal my calendar because I tracked what Lionel was doing at what stage of development and that might be helpful for you. Just a second. Okay, so I've got my calendar here. Um, and this might be helpful for you too. I've done this with all my babies. It's kind of helpful to see progress, to see when they're you know not sleeping as well, all that stuff. I don't know, I like to track things. It, it's interesting to me. Um, so the first week he was giving me six hours a night, five hours a night for his longest stretch. And then I was like, wait, he's not back up to birth weight. I need to be waking him up still every three hours. So don't do that. Uh, all through that first week until they're back up to birth weight, you don't want them to just sleep as long as they can during the night. You wanna be waking them up every three hours, all day and all night, making sure they don't go past that three hour mark um, at that stage. So that's when I remembered and I was like, wait a second. This is, I'm doing this wrong. So started waking him up every three until he was past his birth, birth weight. Um, second week, he was giving, you know, a six hour stretch and then a two hour stretch and then a two hour stretch. Um, and you know, when I say a two hour stretch, that's from start to start. So we're nursing for about 45 minutes. So I'm getting like an hour and 15 of sleep and then he's waking up again. But you know, that's just, that's just postpartum for you. And, and these are good times because with my first, again, four, uh, my first three were five pounds, six pounds, six pounds, and my fourth was barely over seven pounds. Um, they did not sleep so good as far as their stretches were a lot shorter. Um, those first two or three weeks, they were going every three hours max, maybe I get a four hour stretch in. Um, okay, so weeks one, two, three, 
around four weeks, I got my first seven hour stretch and then two and a half hours and then he was up for the day. Um, then the next day I got five hours, then a three hour stretch, then a two and a half hour stretch. Then here, see the sleep isn't linear. The next night he gave me four and a half hours, then three hours, then two hours. Uh, the next night was five and a half hours and then three and a half hours. And then as of this last week, he gave me five hours <laughs> starting the week and then a two hour stretch and a two hour stretch. So not great. But then this is again, sleep is not linear. Two hours later, two days later, he started giving me seven hours, seven and a half hours, um, eight hours, eight hours, eight hours, seven and a half hours with these little random stretches after that of an hour and a half or two hours. So that's, that's hopefully that's helpful. I know that's a lot of numbers and it's hard to visualize. So maybe you have to like take notes and every baby's different um, based off of how they're gaining weight or how they're developing. So the numbers as far as hours that my babies are sleeping every night is a, is totally different for every single child. What is consistent is between the weeks of six and eight weeks, they're giving me those six and seven hour stretches. Uh, Lionel is an exception and he's blowing that out of the park because he is heavier. Okay, so just to kind of tie in everything we've been talking about, because it's been a lot. During the day, when your baby wakes up, you're on a strict every three hour schedule from start to start. In the evening, you can change that up. Thank you so much. I'm sorry, I just keep coughing. I had to get Elisha to bring me some water because I'm just <laughs> talking too much. Okay, okay, just to recap where we've, you know, cause I know this is a lot. During the day, every three hours from start to start, you are feeding baby only every three hours. If they get fussy before that, you're holding them off. You aren't comforting them with feeding, but you are comforting them with suckling either your finger or a pacifier or something like that, or holding them against you. You know, you're comforting your baby, but you aren't giving them food unless it's on a three hour schedule. In the evening, you are doing the dream feed, if you would like. If you aren't going to bed at the same time as baby, you could do the dream feed one hour after he goes to bed, two hours after he goes to bed. It doesn't matter. You're letting baby sleep as long as they want to and then nursing them and helping them go back to bed, which we'll talk about in a minute. Hopefully you're, if you're keeping the lights down low, you're keeping them well burped. Um, you're not letting any air or gas get in there and you are you know, trying to keep all the changes. If you are changing their clothes, you are changing your diaper happening in the middle of your nursing or at the tail end and then topping baby off once you're done with that. All those things are gonna help them go back to sleep. And then in the morning, you are setting your start time for your baby. So you don't have to let baby, you aren't at the whim of your baby. So say that they wake up at five o'clock and they're just awake for the day. And then you're going, okay, so my nursing times are five and then six, seven, eight, and then 11. And then, you know, you have your time set by baby. Well, what if that's not very conducive to your schedule, right? And you have to leave the house to drop off the kids at a certain time. And you're going to be driving when you should be nursing technically on a schedule or say, you know, oh, bummer, that's going to be all during meal times. Um, that's not really helpful, right? So in the morning, you can set baby's start time. And this doesn't have to be three hours at all. You just go for every three hours based off whatever time you decide to start your day on. So you say baby wakes up at four in the morning, you nurse, and then he wakes up at six in the morning, you nurse. And then you decide that that day, it's really helpful to start your every three hours at eight o'clock. Then even though it's only been two hours from six to eight, you just start baby at eight o'clock. And that's what you're basing your three hours on throughout the remainder of the day. Uh, so yeah, this is a schedule, but it also works for, for you. <laughs> you make it work for you. And as far as that start time, you can wake up baby to have that start time, or maybe baby's been awake for a couple hours and you just comfort them some other way until you're ready to start that start time for the rest of the day and base your schedule off of that. So the dream feed and the start time are the two feedings during the day where 
you're picking what is ideal for your schedule and lining up baby with that. So the dream feeds based off your bedtime and the start feeding is based off of uh, your, your plans for the day. Okay, so a couple other things real quick uh, to keep in mind. One is baby physically cannot and should not sleep through the night until they are heavy enough to do so. So you have to have patience with this because if you have a lightweight baby like I have had, then it they can't sleep through the night. It's not healthy for them, first of all, when you're first starting out. And then they're physically incapable of it later on, even if they've gained a little weight so they can be awake a little bit more during the night, they aren't able to sleep those longer stretches because they need the food very often. They don't have those fat stores. So you have to be really patient with this as your sleep deprivation is growing. Uh, keep the schedule though, and keep doing the same things, even if you're nursing a lot during the night, because you're going to, as soon as they're heavy enough, they're gonna start sleeping those long stretches because you're going to have gently transitioned their expectations from having most of their feeds be at night and being awake at night to having that happen during the day. So even if it doesn't feel like anything good is coming of this, uh, you just ha you've, you're you helping them make that transition and it's going to click as soon as they're heavy enough to sleep through the night. So don't give up hope, you aren't doing anything wrong if it's um, you know taking them a while to put on weight. Keep doing the same things and it will all click right away. I often get asked, how do you keep your supply up when you aren't nursing on demand during the day? And really it's just the length of time that matters. It's not necessarily how often baby is snacking. And so I nurse often the right side and then burp and then nurse the left side and then burp and then do a repeat. Do the right side, do the left side until baby is stuffed <laughs> and very happy and content. And you know baby's happy and content. Their arms are hanging down by their sides. They aren't all bunched up like this. They aren't sucking on their hands or, or their fingers. They aren't agitated because there's gas in their belly and they're making all these weird faces and moving their legs all weird. They're just like totally relaxed and like milk drunk. That's what you want. Um, that's when you know baby is is very full and that will keep your milk supply strong um i mean i don't know what your milk supply situation is some women just don't have a good milk supply but that keeps my milk supply strong i should say for over a year and usually i'm getting pregnant during that time in weaning or whatever but i've, I've been able to keep my milk until i get pregnant again if i would like to do that and so that's just how i keep my milk milk really strong, um, not nursing on demand. Again, I don't use a pacifier or a swaddle because those are things that I have to take away later and often those will lead to a sleep regression. So we just don't get used to them in the beginning. <laughs> Baby didn't have a passy in my stomach. It didn't have a swaddle on my stomach. So I just try to, for myself, um, eliminate things that are going to make me have to go retrain later. Uh, my kiddos have all sucks their thumbs. And so that is something that I have to retrain later, but it's like when they're three and four years old and a lot more manageable. <laughs> and like, I can, a lot easier, I should say, than trying to do something with an infant. A quick word about naps, because I also get asked about this a lot. Uh, I let babies sleep whenever they want, on me, off me, on their tummy, on their back, in their bouncer, whatever, for, you know, the duration of the six week postpartum period. But around weeks three or so, then I start to get them used to getting kind of drowsy, not being totally asleep and laying them down on their belly and taking a little nap at least one time during the day. Sometimes I'll do this two or three times during the day for certain naps that they're having just to get them used to falling asleep on their own. Uh, again, my babies are never fussing during this time when I lay them down for their naps. If I lay them down and you know their eyes pop wide open and they start crying, no big deal. I just pick them up, soothe them, go along with my day. We'll try again later. Maybe we'll try again tomorrow. But by sporadically doing that, baby starts to get used to taking naps on their own and being able to be drowsy, be laid down and be like, hey, this isn't the end of the world. I kind of like it here and taking a nap. So I start to experiment with that around three weeks. I'm not super consistent with it, but by the time we're at six to eight weeks, baby is taking a couple naps on their tummies and I 
always have an afternoon nap where all my kids nap at the same time and baby starts to nap during that afternoon nap with everybody else. Uh, so that is on naps. Something else on naps are babies have a 45 minute sleep cycle, so like sleep to wake cycle. So just for nap time, this might be something that's helpful for you. If baby wakes up and starts to fuss, give them a minute. It doesn't have to be like, if they're, if they're full blown crying and upset, yeah, pick them up. But what I have found, like tonight this happened, baby was in his bouncer and he started crying. The kids go, mama, he's crying. I'm like, I know I can hear him. And so I had pizza in the oven. I pulled out the pizza real quick and I went to go put on my wrap because I was in the middle of making dinner and I needed my hands free. So by the time I got my wrap snapped on, he stopped crying. This is all of a minute, maybe two minutes max. And he was back asleep again and he slept for another 30 minutes. So that's actually pretty typical with babies. Uh, I, again, I was going to get him, but if you just let them fuss for a minute, as long as it's not like, you know, they're agitated or something like that, then they might just go back to sleep. So it's something to kind of keep in mind with your babies. Help babies lay back down in the middle of the night. Typically only the first three weeks when I'm having them like be comforted next to me and then kind of go sleep on their own. That's typically the only time when I've had issue with baby going back to sleep on their own. If I was just to nurse them and directly put them in a bassinet by themselves, they'd probably fuss because they're used to being awake. They're used to being close to mommy. And I used to do that with my first couple. I just, put them right back in their bed by themselves. They'd fuss for a few minutes and then they go to bed. But I did not like laying there and listen to them fuss and being like, am I gonna have to get back up and soothe them? Or are they gonna soothe themselves back to sleep? It was just annoying for me <laughs> to deal with any amount of crying during the night. So now having them fall asleep next to me has totally eliminated that. And I find that at least I found this time at three weeks, I can just put baby back in his bed and he just goes to sleep no problem on his own because I did that little like transition period with him. Something that I do listen for when I put baby back down on their tummy is I stay awake for a few minutes and listen for a couple things. One, if I haven't been able to get a burp out, they likely are gonna grunt around and get a burp out. And sometimes that comes with spit up Sometimes if they just drunk a lot, that comes with spit up. And so I kind of listen for that. And if they have spit up on their bed, then I don't pick them up. I just wipe it away with a burp rag and then slide them to the side so that they are out of the spit up because no one wants to sleep in a big wet spot in their bed and let them go back to bed. Um, so that hasn't been an issue that hasn't woken any of my babies up, but I do pay attention and listen to that because no one wants to be lying in their spit up. <laughs> and if, if they do lay there and lie in it, then they probably will get fussy and worked up and then you have to pick them up and maybe nurse them again or something like that to get them to go back to sleep. But I haven't had any issues with this as long as I immediately wipe away the spit up and then just move them to the side. So if baby is still fussy, this is around three weeks and this is the stage where you're just nursing them, putting them in their own bed, right? or nursing them, putting them in your bed, whatever. You're just doing a direct nurse to bed situation and you aren't snuggling with them in your bed in the interim period. And they decide they don't wanna to go to bed and they aren't happy with that. Then what I do, instead of letting them sit there and try to fuss and self-soothe and all that, I'm just like, whatever, come to bed with me. And I go back to what we were doing the first three weeks where I let them fall asleep to the side of me and then I, move them to their own bed. So this will happen, let's see, I wrote down on the calendar, this happened once at four weeks, this happened um, twice at five weeks, it hasn't happened for the last few weeks, um, but it just sporadically would happen, say at like a five in the morning feeding or something, and they think they wanna be awake for the day and they don't wanna go back to bed, and I'm like, I'm not ready to be up, then I go back to that old lay next to mommy, fall asleep, and then I'll move you over uh, situation. So again, this is not, going to get baby used to needing to sleep next to you because uh, their other feedings during the night, they were just going to sleep on their own. 
uh, but it's a helpful tool to have in your back pocket. If they just aren't having it, they don't want to go back to bed. You don't have to let them fuss it out. You can just, or cry it out or whatever. You can just have them be comforted next to you and then move them over. And that's not going to inhibit the sleep training process. So <laughs> that was a lot. Hopefully you took some notes and made sense. I know I was jumping all around. So hopefully you can piece something together there. This is what I've done for all five kiddos. This is, you know, with with shifting some things along the way. Again, I no longer let my babies fuss for any period of time um, because it's just annoying to me in the middle of the night to listen to that. And so we've just eliminated that completely. And you're able to do that if you're doing this right out of the gate. You know, day three, day four, at least you're doing it during the first week, you are getting them on that rhythm. If you're trying to do this with a baby that's older, so say, okay, I'm already past that mark and my baby is four months or six months or nine months, it's going to be harder. It's going to be a lot harder because baby is used to a different rhythm that you've established. And whatever that rhythm is, they don't wanna break it. They don't wanna change it. They like what it is. And so you're going to, you can absolutely shift them to um, sleeping on this schedule, but it will probably be harder. The nice thing about this is that you're doing most of the work during the day when you're scheduling your feedings, you aren't doing the work at night. And that's what I like about this um, sleep training method. I know taking care of babies, a lot of women have had success with her uh, method with older babies when babies are four or five months you know, and on months old, but I just like to do this right out of the gate, get it done. As far as regressions go, because this is another, I'm trying to make this like a video that is all inclusive of all the questions I've gotten over the years so that it's just like a one-stop resource. Uh, as far as sleep regressions go, my babies have not dealt with sleep regressions. Um, I found that there's two reasons my babies don't sleep through the night when it comes to say four months old or six months old or whatever the case may be. One, they are um, teething. And so they're sick during the middle of the night. Maybe they have a fever, they're uncomfortable. And if baby wakes up and starts crying, I feed them and I put them back down. So even if that breaks their pattern, but for me, it's only been say two nights and then they go back to just sleeping on their own. Um, at that stage at four months, if they wake up, they're in their own room at that stage. So I don't know if they wake up and kind of fuss around, I don't hear them. I only hear my babies. I keep my door open and the baby's door open, but I only hear them if they cry, like they're upset and they want mommy. So if they're waking up for a couple minutes and fussing lightly, I don't hear that. So I don't know if that's happening at four months. Um, but I do know that they haven't had any regressions, they aren't waking up and actually crying for long periods of time at all during that stage. The other reason why they might start to regress, I have found is just because my milk isn't cutting it anymore. They are still hungry. And so at that point, I will feed them, you know, maybe applesauce or banana or something right before bed and then nurse them or yeah, yeah, that's typically what I do. But I give them food plus um, nursing or I will give them food or if I'm just exclusively nursing, I might, I'm trying to remember what I do. I supplement something during this time. Um, yeah, my milk just isn't cutting it. So I might nurse them. I might give them a bottle after that. Um, yeah, but typically that's when they are starting to eat anyways during the day. And so I just give them something extra to help hold them over during that night period. Typically it's been either, you know, they're going through a growth spurt and they need more food, which is only when they're like six months plus, or they're going through those teething stages when it's under six months. Um, but I haven't had any issue when it comes to teething when I nurse them in the middle of the night where they just start anticipating that. And then all of a sudden I'm nursing them every couple hours or something like that. Cause again, they're in their own room. And so they aren't like right next to me. I don't know. I don't know what it is, but, but that has just uh, been the case. 
with our kiddos. I will update you down below in the description box if that is not the case with Lionel this time. Anyways, okay, hopefully that was helpful for you guys. This this video was not intended to like change anybody's mind. There are different types of mothering and I think that they can all be very successful. They can all be very healthy for baby, very health, healthy for mama. Um, I find that this is the easiest way for me to not only get sleep, but me to avoid more trauma <laughs> for me down the road if I'm trying to transition an older child. They have a lot more stamina and they're used to a totally different schedule and changing all of that for them can lead to at least what I've heard, some uh, battles in the bedroom. And I just, I just prefer to avoid that if I can help it. All of our kiddos, our toddlers, they sleep through the night. And when you have six, five, four, you know, two and one, two and zero, you know, people assume that you don't get any sleep, but we have great sleep and our toddlers stay in their beds and our babies stay in their beds. And it's been a big blessing to our family. Hopefully this was helpful for you. If it's not, no worries. I hope you find another great resource out there, find something that works for you. And we will be back next week with Elisha and I and more of our regular programming. Okay, bye you guys. Cheers.